Good afternoon and welcome to this Insight event on inclusive investment, um, which we're holding ahead of International Women's Day next Wednesday. Um, I'm Lindsay Tapp, I'm Director of Communications here at CDC, soon to be British International Investment. Um, and we as an organisation have been focusing on women's economic empowerment since 2017, but gender lens investing has really been growing over the last decade. Um, so why is it so important? Um, so before I introduce our guests, um, I want to say why it's important to us. Investing in women really pays off. We know that breaking down barriers for women to work in certain sectors or jobs can lead to an increase in labour productivity of about 25% in some countries. And we also know that investing in women can result in better health and education for future generations due to the way that women spend their money once they're in the household. And of course, women are rising as entrepreneurs. Between about 31 and 38% of all SMEs in emerging markets are either fully or partially women owned, yet nearly 70% um, complain that they do not get um, the service or the support that they would like to have from financial institutions. And this represents a financial opportunity to serve this market of about $320 billion. So the format of today's events is much like our normal events. I'll be holding a short one-on-one -on -one with our guests and then a discussion with both. And please um, remember to put your questions into the Q&A function and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can towards the end. So now on to our guests. I'm delighted today actually to be joined by two stalwarts of um, inclusive investment and financing. Roshana Zafar is um, Managing Director and Founder of the Cash Foundation. Um, Cash is one of our investees and one of the leading microfinance institutions in Pakistan. Um, it promotes female entrepreneurship and has so far enabled more than 1 million low-income families across Pakistan to improve their standard of living. And we'll also be joined by Hani Assad, who is the founding partner at Avaz Capital Partners, which is a global emerging markets private equity firm. Hani has had nearly 30 years experience in development finance, and it sounds like it was actually part of his journey at the IFC where he really started to see and leverage the opportunity that men have to advocate for gender smart investing. And it sounds like it was quite a painstaking process for him going around persuading team by team that it's important to have more women investors on their teams and that women entrepreneurs are a big market too for them. So welcome to both Roshana and Hani. I'm, I'm going to start with Roshana, who is kindly joining us um, on, on an unexpected journey. She's unexpectedly had to travel, but thank you for joining us this, um, this afternoon, Roshana. Can you hear me okay? Pleasure. Thank you, Lindsay. Great. Wonderful. Oh, you founded Cash Foundation around about 20 years ago. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why, why you chose to found Cash and how it's evolved over this time? So, Lindsay, a lot of it had to do with my own experience of growing up in Pakistan. And then going to study and uh, looking at the opportunity uh, in terms of uh, resources. So it's about opportunity, access to transform. So oh, these were questions that were in my mind. And when I came back to Pakistan and I started working for the World Bank, it was there that I heard these narratives from women where they were continuously talking about, uh, you know, uh, 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 saying that if we, we would be able to influence change with in a household so, so we need to have that economic voice we need to have that that catalyst Roshan, yes, I, the, can't hear you. I was going to say the line is really bad i wonder whether we we try hani first and see Let's whether see, you I get into uh, a... maybe i should try from my <clears throat> good afternoon thank you for joining us um so uh, as I mentioned in the intro, you've been in development finance for almost three decades and have seen the evolution of gender lens investment over that time. Um, could you tell us a bit about your own personal journey um, over that period? So um, I'll start even a bit earlier. Uh, so first, um, uh, I'm Egyptian Canadian and I grew up in Egypt. Um, and I, I have to say that it was the influence of my mother and she, she was a woman in, um, who actually believe very much in that, let's say, parity between uh, boys and girls when I was growing up and men and women. 
um, and uh, she instilled in us, in us, in all the family, about in in those values. And I think we grew up with that. So it was not something that I had to adopt or or you know bring in. It was something that was natural to me. Um, when I was at IFC, one of the big things we had to do in in my early years was to increase the number of uh, women in IFC staff overall, <clears throat> and um, and to to do so. Um, I had basically, uh, in the early days, because now it's an integral part of IFC strategy for hiring, to have a, a more parity in terms of their hiring process. But before that, it was a, it was a bit of an effort. It's how to convince, as you mentioned early, Lindsay, how to convince teams that they should be uh, bringing in more women. There was all the normal excuses, you all heard it. And, uh, but I think the organization overcome that, overcame that over the years when they realized that women were really outperforming. It was not a matter of, you know, it's a nice thing to do. It was actually a difference in performance. So you can Was it quite male dominated when you joined IFC? Oh, yes. It was a, a large percent, percent. I think it was even in the 70% when I first joined. Something of this nature. It's pretty very high. I'm talking about the investment stuff. Hmm. Well, you know, it's not all stuff, but investment stuff. And then it obviously now it has shifted tremendously from that. I do not know the latest numbers. I left IFC about 10 years ago, so I'm not aware of the latest numbers, but it was something that it was a conscious effort that I did, uh, realizing that I knew at that, that time um, that performance of teams improves when you have uh, a better balance. Um, wh whether we call it parity or balance, it's something else. Um, I just should say that I, I personally, I say that all the time. I don't like the word gender. Gender is not specific enough. Um, and I used to always tease my niece who's, uh, who did her studies in gender studies as well as what is gender studies? There is either women or men or, but you know, talk about women. Let's just be courageous enough to say women. And <laughs> I like the fact that in this particular um, uh, webinar, we're specifically saying women. We don't say gender. Uh, it's not that I'm against gender. I'm just saying, let's just be you know, more into it. The other thing that I've learned is it is not a matter of highlighting it. So uh, highlighting mm -hmm. women roles in business it is actually making it as a business uh, imperative and making mm -hmm. it an integral part of what we do, as opposed to saying, oh, let's just do an impact, <clears throat> impact fund that just targets women. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to see it across the board. It's not just one or the other. So it's, it's uh, and, and why is that? We'll talk about that. Why are the reasons? I mean, I look at it from a very business point of view. So why is it good for businesses, the economy in general, um, to have more women participating in decision-making, more women that we invest in, and more women that are being served? We, we will talk about this because it's an important part of, uh, of the journey. Yeah, it seems not right to leave out 51% of the population, does it, when you're thinking about your business decisions? Um, and this, this idea of integration um, across the investment community, you've been very involved with the 2X Collaborative, um, at looking at how we can bring more investors into this space. Um, and you were involved with the 2X Ignite program. Could you tell us a little bit more of that about that and, and the progress that, that you can see being made? So the 2X, uh, 2X Ignite um, addresses the issues of how do we invest more with women-led First, women-led fund managers, women-led companies, and companies that serve women, and then women as a consumer. So it's a whole multiple levels of involvement. Um, it is particularly designed to address what I call the uh, risk perception. So it's how do we bring down the perception of risk that if you're investing in uh, women com uh, with women-led companies, they are more risky. Uh, that's a perception. I mean, people have that perception. It is not reality, we can prove it. There are so many studies prove it otherwise, but how do you bring that level of saying, okay, let's just go for it and, and we will help you get over that uh, risk perception. So the 2X Ignite addresses this not on a, it addresses it on a commercial level. It, it basically says, uh, we're willing to help first time fund managers uh, build up their portfolios before they do uh, set up their funds. So there is this um, wholesaling or let's say, uh, um, there is, sorry, not what I was saying, but uh, <clears throat> they, they can invest ahead of the, the investment made. Then there is a support for first time fund managers, uh, women led fund managers, or women balanced parity as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the other one is, um, so the first one is warehousing. The second one is supporting them with a, some kind of working capital. And the third one is actually helping with the build up of the portfolio itself. It's, uh, right. it's, so on every level, it's an addressing the issues. So the investors who get into this 2X Ignite facility, I don't think they're going to lose money. I think they're going to make a lot of money. I don't think it's a risk issue. It's a perception. Okay. So let's just bring down that perception and then we will be able to invest a lot more. So it, yeah. it's supposed to be multiplying by a long shot, by multiplying by 10 times, let's say, the amount of money being invested in uh, women focused either fund managers or businesses or actually communities uh, as, a, as a consumer. Right, yeah, I, I remember talking to my, some of my colleagues who work in corporate debt who make exactly this point that women are, are much better um, much more reliable repayers of um, debt finance, for example. Um, thank you, Hani. I can see we've got Roshana. I'm hoping that you're in a better area. Um, and can I, can I come to you? Because obviously you, you do finance women directly. So uh, I'd, I'd love to come back to you and talk to you again about the setup of cash and, and what you've been achieving over the last 20 years. Okay, great. So um, I was just telling you that when I start, when I was a student looking at development economics, one of the things that uh, struck me was the fact that women didn't have access to uh, to to, uh, to uh, resources, and the opportunities were hi highly linked to that. So I worked with the World Bank, and in, during that uh, that period, I met a lot of women, and the narrative we would hear really would be uh, the question of how um, how to get the economic bandwidth in terms of influencing the, uh, the choices within their families. So in this journey, I then met Dr. Yunus, who gave me the, you know, the, the opportunity to really see how microfinance worked. And when I came back to Pakistan, uh, my first challenge was really looking at the transaction, how to design a gender sensitive program for women in Pakistan, given the culture and the environment that women entrepreneurs, uh, you know, uh, faced in the country. So the first thing was really looking at, you know, when I conceived it, my idea was train the women and then give them the loans. But we realized that was really not the way forward. Uh, it was first give the loan, then add the training, and then build networks and provide opportunities. So the initial uh, initial model, we, we really changed that. And we focused on designing the lending program, which was around the notion of solidarity lending. Uh, because women uh, tend to work better in groups. Uh, the, the issue that Hani was mentioning on risk taking uh, from the perspective of the investor, that is also how women think uh, when they uh, take loans or they invest in businesses. So they would prefer to be in a, a cooperative uh, setup. Uh, so the groups work. But mm -hmm. over the years, we've changed it. So, so I'll stop here after I mention the change we realized that the groups were beginning to curtail women's uh, enterprises because every entrepreneur has their own journey, their own path. Mm -hmm. So over the past decade, we actually now work with the entrepreneur and the enterprise. And we've added specific trainings for the sectors that they work in. And we also added a lot of insurance products. So that's really how the whole, uh, the, the whole uh, framework works. Originally, we began with just the loan, then we focused on the entrepreneur and the enterprise. And then we looked at the family in terms of what contingencies can hold the entrepreneur back, uh, which were not planned. So that's when the insurance uh, came in. And now we are looking for a pension savings product for long-term savings for women. And how have you found the demand side going? I mean, you talk about this reticence on behalf of women to, to, to um, get involved um, perhaps on their own. Was, was that an easy process or has it been uh, difficult to engage them? So th that's interesting because a lot of times, and I, I'm going to be a little controversial here, a lot of times microfinance practitioners tend to be paternalistic and the concepts are developed by men for women. Uh, hmm. And we don't, we, and even sometimes we as women leaders tend to imbibe the same thinking processes. And we tend to think, you know, we know better than the women, we, uh, the women entrepreneurs, we can decide for them, we can have a cookie cutter approach, because scale matters to us. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to take stock and to listen to the entrepreneurs. And as, as I said, mark their journeys, listen to their narratives. And that's really what started happening 10 years into Kush. The women started coming to us and saying, you know, but I need more money. I need less money. I need money for lo a longer tenure. 
I also need money for consumption smoothing. So um, I need money to invest in my home because that's where my quality of life is. Uh, I need training on uh, digital marketing and so on and so forth as digital marketing and internet marketing emerge. So, you know, listening to, to the clients became very important. Of course, you can't, uh, it becomes very costly to customize uh, completely for every client. You will have to come up with, uh, with, for example, if you're doing livestock, you'll have to come up with products that can meet this, uh, different types of livestock uh, needs, uh, but uh, you can't customize it exactly to every household, but you can give options and you can give plans. So uh, the move over really came from the women themselves because there was a, a what we call now a group lending fatigue in the sector. And that's really what made us think that you need, we need to treat the enterprise, the entrepreneur individually. And was, was it always your intention to focus specifically on women? What, what, why did you choose that approach in particular? Uh, the reason for that was, Lindsay, I mean, I, today I came across a statistic that is, you know, hovering around in my head. I just found out that 10% of the IMF's board are women. So three out of the 30 mm -hmm. are women. So what is that saying to us? That women can't make financial decisions. And that's exactly, that's the up end. That's the ivory tower of financial decision making. Mm -hmm. If you turn it to a woman and you look at the decision she takes uh, at a daily basis, she has to survive at, let's say, three and a half dollars a day and meet all her family's needs. I mean, I think she is the financial wizard. So uh, when, when, I, when I came into this, uh, this field of development, uh, one of the re first research I did was to actually go out and see what amount of money was being invested in women's businesses. And again, Hani made that interesting point, it's reality and perception. So a lot of times we assume women businesses are more risky. And let me tell you, post COVID, uh, we, uh, uh, we had the best portfolio uh, because women paid us back despite the challenges they face. So it's more about perception rather than evidence. Uh, so coming back to my, uh, your question, how did, why did I start with women? So I did that research and I discovered that for every $100 uh, dispensed in the market in 1995 uh, in, as micro loans, only 30% went to women. And even that 30% was being pipelined. What that means is that the men in the family had, you know, women's empowerment is about power and agency. It's about how we determine gender roles in the family. So a lot of times women became the, uh, the you know, the front for getting the loans, but at the back end, it was the men using the money. So they pipelined it. So in a way, uh, microfinance was a disservice to women, the way it was designed originally. Uh, in, in the uh, mid nineties before we came. So we did, we tried to turn it on its head. And if you've seen the outcomes of that, what, what, what difference are you seeing in the lives of the women that you, that you are lending to? Definitely, I think, uh, the, as I always say, there, there are different levels of impact. So you start with the entrepreneur, you know, the self-confidence, the decision-making, the revenue generation, the productivity, the networking, all of that begins to change. And then it translates into uh, interfamilial relationships. So it's interspousal relationships. It's the decision-making in the family. It's, are we sending our children to school? What are they going to eat? Where are we going to live? All those decisions that are basic decisions, but on Maslow's hierarchy of needs are critical for the survival of low-income families. So women begin to interact on that the moment they have uh, money in their, their hands. The respect factor begins to change. Uh, the community begins to see them in a different way. And then, of course, uh, you know, our, our data tells us that uh, women who are running businesses for three years are five times more likely to send their children to school. So mm. in a country like Pakistan, where we have some of the highest out-of-school children, this becomes a primary uh, multiplier effect that you see mm. with earning uh, mothers. So uh, I'm going to broaden, thank you, Roshana, I'm going to broaden the conversation out and I'll introduce Hani back as well, but I'll stay with you because we've got a great, great line with you. Um, we've just started going from the, the micro impact of investing in women and started to draw into that macro impact. Could, could you talk a little bit more about why this focus on investing in women really matters with a broader macro, macroeconomic um, perspective? Um, Lindsay, I think it's now... Um... It's, it's just, you know, it's a no-brainer. Uh, why would we not invest in women? 
can I ask you that question in return? And we will then start thinking about this. I mean, 50% of the world's population is women. Uh, uh, according to a Standards & Poor report, women's uh, worth in terms of investable wealth is rising. So the issues that women care about are going to come in the forefront. Women in leadership are emerging uh, all across the world. So really, we why shouldn't we invest in women? And when we look at uh, the issue of feminization of poverty, if there are 1.6 billion poor people in the world, 70% of them are women. So it's, it's a question of equity. It's a question of human rights. It's a question of uh, correcting the imbalance. It's a question of utilizing the, uh, the opportunity that women re re represent. And you know, uh, if you look at the, and I'll just stop here, if you look at the World Economic Forum's gender gap report, it gives us a very haunting, uh, you know, uh, substantiation of the issue by saying it's going to take us 200 years to overcome the gender mm. gap in, in the economy. Now, it's not going to happen in my lifetime or your lifetime, or perhaps even in our grandchildren's lifetime. But somewhere it has to start. And we have to change the incentives. You know, the reason I, I, I sometimes, I'm an economist and economists work on the basis of incentives, but it's not always about economic incentives. It's also about choices that we make, uh, which have to be done consciously. So when I talk about investing in women, I think it's extremely important we, uh, we make those choices overtly and passionately and clearly and with a business. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying we don't, we do this as affirmative action. It has to be done with a business sense. I'd, I'd like to bring Hani in there from, from an investor perspective. Um, what's your view on the, the this macro context and making the case for investing with, with women? So I'll take the other side of the view from Roshani, Roshani about the business case. So uh, let's just start with the word innovation and the importance of innovation in economic development. That has been proven that innovation uh, addresses uh, create, I mean, innovation in business today uh, <clears throat> brings in productivity, brings in uh, products and services that target specific needs of people. So as we've seen with the digitization of the eco economies, we're now able to provide specific services to one subgroup from far away or from, and that these services become uh, more affordable, more accessible, etc. So we start with innovation. The importance of innovation is the first thing. The second thing is you can't innovate with just men. We know that. So the participation of men and women in innovation is very, very important. Now, we also know that women, and I'll be a little bit more controversial, and I can say that women are very creative and even more so than men on average. I'm talking about averages, not you know the exceptions here and there. But women, why are they more creative and, 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 and able to innovate more? It's because they're a lot more collaborative. And when you, and innovation comes from collaboration, it's exchanging ideas and it's working out the ideas and innovation is that that inter it's the conversation and the between multiple people that comes up with a better idea no one has one good idea that's going to run all the way we need that back and forth so that collaborative approach makes women a lot more innovative than if you only have uh, if you if you have men for sure they're not as much in, in innovation so let's just look at that then you look at the next step which is how do women work in teams? So teams become a lot more productive when there are more women in it. And there are studies, and I've been asked to give you some evidence. There's a McKinsey study that I, I, I've read that shows you that teams that have more women in them increase their productivity, I, I can tell you, 128%. That's a large number. It's 128% increase in productivity when there are more women in a team than no women. Okay, so that's... There are studies that show you that. So if you take that productivity and then you get that innovation together, then yes, women are an integral part of best practice in business today. So now, now let's look at the returns from an investment point of view. So as, as you well know, IFC has done a study um, in, uh, in 2019, issued on the 8th of, February, uh, 8th of March, International Women's Day, um, that demonstrated that um, if you have more women in the fund management team, I think they said above the 30%. It's not as 50% yet, but let's say in 30% and above, you get a 20% increase in return. That's a large percent increase in return that is worth making that effort. So if you, so that's just on the return. 
But then in terms of why do you want more women in investment teams? So let's just look at that because I focus on that a great deal. It's because women can, can figure out how to invest with women-led organizations or companies that, uh, that invest in products and services that are particularly suited for women. Um, and that ability to see a, a woman being presented to a fund manager and being able to assess that uh, ability is something that men sometimes don't, don't, uh, don't, don't do very well. So in terms of, you know, I, I go back to the decision-making, who makes decisions across the world in, in any kind of expenditure? Um, is it only men? Is it, uh, is it only women? No, it's a combination of both. So if we, if we forego 50% of the decision makers, and I think it's even 70%, may, women make 70% of the purchases, then you'd see yeah. that it changes the dynamics a great deal when you don't, we don't know how to make that assessment of uh, good businesses that uh, women lead. Yeah, and I, I think I'm picking up something from what Roshana has said, and actually what you've said as well, is that, it's, that gender lens investing, investing in women is still sometimes seen as a niche, and it really shouldn't do because we don't think about segmentation in that sort of niche way in any other part of business. So uh, what do, what do you think we need to do to start making this sort of adoption of more inclusive investment policies and practices more mainstream? So, I'll start with um, you, Hannah. I'll start, yes. So uh, I was looking at some statistics and um, I gave that statistics earlier uh, yesterday at another talk. So there is about 69 trillion assets under management around the world today. Um, study showed that that 69 trillion, 98.7% decision makers are men. So obviously they missed the point. 98.7% of decision makers of how to allocate this money are men. So that's the first thing. So need, need to change at the investor level. So the investors themselves need to be more diverse in thinking. Um, number two is the fund managers who are actually now allocators to companies need to be changed as well. And we say it's not 50-50 again, get to 20%, get to 23%, then you start making the change. So, so it's, 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 it's how we look at investment decision-making that's going to bring to that, uh, you know, that changes. So in, in my view, there are very simple things to do. <laughs> um, I tell investors, just ask the question. Ask the question, why are no women in your team, in your fund management team? If you ask that question, then they start thinking about it and they say, I need to answer that question. And if I need to answer that question, I need to have a reason why there are no women in my team. And I have to start thinking about the next time I do, I hire another person, right? If you get all investors to start saying that, and by the way, this is why there's a due diligence uh, questionnaire now with this question in there, right? So that investors start asking those questions, that's going to be a major change in how we do business. Because once you ask it, there must be an answer. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is, no, I, I do not know why I don't have any women, or give you a very silly answer, I cannot find them, right? That's, I get that all the time. Uh, then, <laughs> then, then, you know, then, then you can address that. And Roshana, when, when you're talking to your peers, um, obviously you're, you're, you're approaching your business from a, a woman-centric perspective. What, what sort of, what sort of um, uh, arguments or processes do you put forward to, to your peers to sort of break down some of those barriers? I think the, Lindsay, again, a very good question because women have to work harder to prove themselves in whatever field they are. And they, you know, they have to work twice as much as men at times. And I see that in my organization. I mean, I'm, I, I think some of the points that Hani made before I come to the main question that you asked in terms of how do we break the myths around women's investments and, and how do you convince other people around you? Uh, even within uh, my organization, 50% of the staff are women. 70% of my board are women. So we've been very, very conscious in ensuring that women voices are heard and that they are part of the policies that we make. I often say that uh, a lot of times the HR policies that we have, they have, they've been made by men for men. And now what COVID did, I mean, the silver lining around COVID was that it forced us to rethink about uh, flexibility in a lot of the work from home uh, options and so on and so forth, which suit women more. So similarly, similarly, when it comes to convincing peers that women are good investing, I think the numbers speak for themselves. As I said to you, uh, we, uh, despite COVID, 
despite the fact that women's businesses were uh, you know uh, much more affected uh, from, uh, by covid because they worked in businesses that had uh, that were linked to uh, closures and lockdowns for example beauty salons or schools or what have you so they were much more affected uh, from the uh, from covid and we do know uh, from data that's coming back that the poverty incidence amongst females is going to increase post covid uh, much more than it has amongst men so keeping that as a, a purview post covid women have performed better despite the challenges they face and one of the things we do need to do is to document this and show that this works so i think uh, one of the parameters should be to see if you are a for profit organization how, how does women's participation at the board at the at the level of the employees and at the level of the clientele uh, what returns that, does that give you uh, with or without, without if we read the, the mckinsey report that hani mentioned we'd all be better off if women are part of the economy that's what the the, the bottom line of that report is uh, gdp growth is going to increase now i'm not a proponent of saying that we only and only look at gdp growth to measure change we also mm -hmm. need to look at all the other factors that uh, i had mentioned earlier which is decision making health uh education investment in the children investment in quality of life and so on and so forth those are equally important parameters to convince uh peers regarding the business case for women and are the other ways that you can see that we can more effectively build this conversation to to address the needs and gaps that women have because i think the case is there but we we we've not yet entirely bridged bridged that gap is it more innovation is it different you talked about different types of financing that are needed um roshana do you where do you see the the sort of next next front on the battlefield is on this i think the first thing is level playing field minzy that factor has to be there i as i said i'm not a pro proponent for affirmative action yes it's needed sometimes to create that level playing field for uh for women startups and tech uh, you know whatever whatever sector you are looking at uh, data does tell us that women uh, women led uh, enterprises tend to be underfunded uh, that's the general perception because the risk is, is seen to be higher so we have to overcome this like i said through data through a better business case i also see you know i, I give an example sometimes when you have a, a man and a woman applying for the same position and you look at their cvs uh the ma man cv will always oversell and the woman cv will always undersell i don't know if it's true for other cultures but it is true for pakistan so often i look at the cv and i say to myself okay i'm going to cut the man i'm going to give the woman flack and i'm going to cut down the man in terms of assessing and it's the same goes for when the woman is interviewing she will be very diffident she will be very she 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 just run herself down to a large extent the same goes for women investors uh, you know i uh, when i was trying to raise money uh, from different investors i'm talking now to, uh, 15 years ago 20 years ago this was the early times uh, it was very hard like you said uh, men tend to have the old boys club so they can go for golf with the banker and get the loan it was very difficult for me to to you know to be able to open the door for myself because the culture didn't allow it i couldn't go out and have to play golf with the banker and get my loan done because that's how a lot of deals were being done in in those time and i'm sure that's true now also but what i'm share, sharing with you are the uh, the barriers uh, that women face which are not overt uh, they are usually underlying uh, the way and so that cuts the networking is not there the association is not there sometimes the data is not there and sometimes your own inability to express Uh, the value of your business is not there either so all of this these things compound though things are changing now i i see the space changing the younger entrepreneurs that are now coming up they're much more with it uh, and they're much more able to express themselves but yes you're right we still have a long way to go and thank you and and, and honey do, where do you see us being able to bridge that gap is it product uh, no again i will go back to my field which is uh, investing in funds and in, in private equity and venture capital in emerging markets um and i would say that it starts with the fund managers 
Um, and and um, I can see that Seema had put in a question about uh, uh, her journey as a uh, to unlock. What, um, anyway, to, to get the support from LPs, even though they have a, a purpose for first time female fund managers. Um, the, the it's it's very much what uh, Roshani was saying is how do the how do uh, women led fund managers present themselves that are a lot more realistic compared to men who actually oversell mm -hmm. uh, it is being able to and I can see that uh, Melania had put another question about how do uh, women fund managers present themselves in front of LPs mm -hmm. um, and I would say that it is you have to be natural. So it's, it's actually bringing up the topic is important to say, what are the differences between the all men teams and uh, teams with more women in them? And what's the performance and what do they do? Um, so in terms of track record, this is exactly what uh, uh, 2X Ignite is doing, is providing first time fund managers with the ability to build a track record. Um, and that's critical. Um, we talked about the perception of risk. It's not an issue of adding money that specializes that is targeting uh, you know women it is how do we again go back to this perception of risk how do we bring it down through uh, financial products that can help investors uh, go over that barrier so this um, building the, the the track record is one uh, building a, um, uh, a pipeline of these that they bring into a, a, a fund is another one um, um, changing the composition of the of the fund managers, and I, I, you know, it's when, when I see, for instance, an old men fund managers, people have heard me say that a, a lot. I say, you're way too monochrome for me. Do I not invest with them? I, if they say that they're willing to change and add more women to their teams, then that's, that's the reason. And the main thing is that fund managers, when they're investing, I mean, they're fundraising now, they have to think about their next fund. So if they say they're going to add more women and they don't do it, and we come back later and say, well, you have not you have not done what you said you're going to do, that doesn't help them in the next fund when, when they're coming to, to fundraise. So there is, a, there is a certain balance in there. So if, if go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say, you, you've mentioned our audience who've been asking questions and actually one of the ones comes, one of the questions we've received actually plays into this question of risk that, that you've just raised. It's from Anne Rulin, who said that, you've said there's plenty of evidence that investing in women is not risky. Um, can, you, can you give some examples? It's all of success. So the, the first one is when you're talking about success is uh, are the returns better when there are more women uh, in fund management teams and they're addressing more women in their and more women led companies uh, and the IFC evidence is there to suggest so but there's a lot more I mean I was looking at a number of reports uh, lately that has uh, demonstrated this. The McKinsey report is an excellent report uh, that, that you can, I'm sure you can read it. There is also even a summary of it. Um, and it, it is not just emerging markets across the board. So it tells you that there is strong evidence to suggest and numeric evidence. I'm talking about surveys McKinsey had done to suggest that there is actually um, a lower risk and a higher return. I mean, this is, so you actually get to that. Um, that's a McKinsey study, it's available. Um, and so just to be to be clear, why is that the case? We just, Roshani mentioned it, is women are a lot more uh, careful. Men, I mean, I, I had the same exact same issue, uh, Roshani, when she was saying in hiring people, you know, get CVs and you knew that the men were, you know, overselling themselves and the women were underselling themselves. So you have to basically adjust for that overselling part and get over it and say, let's, let, let's look at the actually fundamentals and it's when you have the interviews it's exactly the same thing men were oversell themselves invariably i'm not i'm it's not like uniquely it's a lot and you even don't and it's it's just the, it's the nature of it so yeah. it's, uh, so the other thing i always say is that women should not take the role of men in the sense that they should not adopt the way men do things and exaggerate etc they should actually get men to understand the way they do things that women do things as opposed to the other way around that, that for me is very important we should not assume the business habits of men and for women and then say, ah, oh, that's the right way to do it. Mm. Women just, because women have a lot to contribute. So it's how to show that and, and sell that, that becomes really important, not, not adopt other ways. I, 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 I'd like to ask the next question to both you and to Roshana, and it's following on from, I think you, saw, you mentioned one of Seema's questions about 
how it how it how she'd found it difficult. Um, one of the criticisms she puts over is that you know a lot of lip service is given, but when the rubber hits the road, um, even development focused LPs can back away. Um, so there's this it's sort of chiming back in with Roshanna's reference to affirmative action. Should 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 there be more um, uh, more affirmative action about you know not giving funding, not investing into emerging market companies that don't have small proportions of women on the board and so on. What, what, what are your views on that? And I'll start with you, Hani, and then come to um, Roshanna. So my view is that it, it's, so it, it's like, exactly like ESG. It's the same principle. You don't not invest in a company because they have not done something yet. If they commit to do it, that's a major step forward. And then you monitor their progress over time. And that, that, so if you, they commit to have more women on their boards and you basically have a plan with them, an agreement that they commit within a certain period of time, what is that period of time? It's to be decided between the two, the two parties. And then if they don't do it, it means that they have not achieved one of their objectives. Uh, as you know, there are many governments right now that are uh, putting conditions on companies to have one or two uh, women board members to start the conversations. Not that that's the minimum requirement. I mean, that's the requirement. No, this is just to get the boards to start thinking about that. So I saw governments uh, increase it from one to two lately, and they made it from listed companies to private companies of a certain size. You start the ball rolling with policy on one side, and then investors on the other asking the questions and making sure that there are, there are you know, uh, KPIs that says you shall have that many number of women within a certain part. Um, but I'd, let's just go back to Seema's question about uh, uh, why there's a lip service and not. So it's essentially women, I mean, the, women have to have the, also the track record, have to have the ability to manage the fund, et cetera. So you have to demonstrate that. And if you demonstrate that and you have the, uh, 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 you know, you have a very good strategy, you have a great team and you have a good pipeline for your fund, um, there is no reason why an investor would not go. So it's, it's, all I'm saying is you should not make it as a, you must do this, having, you know, must invest in women only uh, when women manage uh, fund, uh, funds, but how do we bring up the, the fund managers that are women led to the, to the best practice quality or the best quality that there is, and then say, see, there's no difference. Even there is, these teams are even better than the men, the only men, that's for sure. Um, and then get the investors to look at that this way. So there's some work that needs to be done at that level, uh, mm -hmm. which we do actually. We have an entire capacity building program around how do we make sure that fund managers are the best there is in what they do. And so that there is no distinction between, uh, you know, if one or the other, I think this has to be gender parity in both. Um, so yes, so it's, it's not that you need to set it aside as an exception. That's what I'm saying. I will come to Roshana very shortly, but I, I just want to ask a question that's coming from somebody who actually works at um, our organization about how do you how do you square this view that if you need someone to have the track record, that there's actually a very small pool of women investors who have a 20 year plus track record. Um, how, how do you actually, yeah, how do we accelerate change if, if that's the if that's the reality of where we are today? So can we be more fle flexible, for example? So I'll, I'll, first I'll tell you is that a track record can be an individual and can be a team. Mm -hmm. So it does not need to be that specific team have done this track record in the beginning. And track record is not uh, something that you have to have for 20 years. You just have to show that you have done all parts of, of, of what's required from an investor. So the selection of companies, the investing in the company, adding value and exiting. So if you show that within the team, they've done all of these different values, you start building a track record this way and then it doesn't have to be invested in one individual it could be absolutely that's why we have teams but that's why you'd never invest in a one person team okay it doesn't exist i mean for me when a fund manager comes to me i'm the only fund manager there's nobody else with me i tell them there's no way you don't have the ability to cover everything right so so it so when we were at ifc we did 65 first time fund managers um and we learned what it means to invest in, uh, um, uh, in, in first time fund managers by looking through their track record, which we define in a different way uh, in the past, which is what I was just saying. You have to demonstrate you've done the whole cycle. So one person could have done an exit, sold a company, but the other person could have been very good at you know, adding value to a company. That's the whole idea. 
This is reminding me of what Roshanna was saying a little earlier about women feeling as though they need to have done everything in order to apply for a job and they undersell themselves. And um, uh, perhaps it, it, it chimes in with that a little bit. Roshanna, is there anything you would like to add on, on the, anything that's just been asked? I don't think there are two, uh, two sides to this. So if you're talking about the investability of women's businesses, the first thing is uh, in, uh, what I would ideally want to see is an incubation uh, set up where you could incubate those businesses. You could help women write the right business plan and coach them and mentor them uh, to be able to present their case better. So I think that's definitely something that can be done from the perspective of investability to ensure that women uh, who are uh, women-led enterprises do get the funding. Uh, this is, I'm talking about larger scale businesses. For mm -hmm. smaller scale businesses, of course, the kind of client that we work with, it's essential to make sure that we use a gender lens every time we design a product. So going through mm -hmm. the entire cycle of product design becomes extremely, extremely important. And, you know, we, for example, I'll give you a simple example. When we were designing a health insurance product for women, uh, we went to the insurance companies and they said reproductive health is not going to be covered. And mm -hmm. our point was, well, if it's women clients, reproductive health has to be covered. Uh, so we convinced them ultimately to provide that cover, which they were, and we, we you know, we, we tweaked it in a way that it was of value to the, uh, the insurance company as well. You know, so I always say that for any uh, gender lens product, you have to have the investability and the business case for doing that. So uh, the, the research, the product, the design, and women's uh, needs have to be reflected in it. And mm -hmm. at the same time, whoever's providing it, it must be a win-win for them as well. So I think mm -hmm. those two points would also be important uh, to ensure that uh, whatever products are provided for women, uh, the, the, as I was saying earlier also, we have a level playing field for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that those are the two points I'd like to add. Um, Roshanna, the, some of the questions that are coming through, and this, this might be something you'd particularly have a, a view on, are looking at this point of intersectionality that, that it's particularly women within marginalized or vulnerable com communities um, that have barriers to access access finance um, or for example if it's fund managers it's 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 fund managers from a particular country rather than expats um, that are having that are seeing barriers to, to raising finance and um, what what do you think we can do to to address some of those structural bar barriers? So uh, then, like, if you look at the structural barriers, there are four kinds of barriers. Uh, one would be, of course, the culture. What we talk about gender norms and how they are determined. Uh, you know, mobility of women, the access to markets, the access to education. All of those things are endemically tied to the culture and the environment. Uh, the second is legal. You know, a woman setting up a business. To give you a simple example from my my own experience. Uh, when I started Kash uh, and I needed to rent an office space, uh, I every time I, I found an appropriate spot, a place, uh, the landlord would, the first thing they would ask me, where's your husband to sign on this lease? Where's your, who's going to you know the man has to sign on your behalf for you to lease it? So there are lots of hidden uh, legal barriers that women confront. Uh, and that also comes within whether you have to register your business, whether you have to open a bank account, all of those are factors that, that impinge on women. Then there are financial access to finance, uh, which is, uh, as I already mentioned to you, we have to design products that meet women's needs, but at the same time are sustainable. Otherwise you won't be able to massify them or uh, provide them in the long run. And then the fourth is what I, I had also alluded to earlier are the hurdles that come from within ourselves as women. Mm. Uh, uh, Hani made a very good point that we don't have to become like men. Mm. No, I'm not saying that at all. But as women leaders, a lot of times, uh, you know, if a woman is assertive, she's considered to be aggressive. So uh, there, again, there's a question of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reality and perception, but we don't have have to become like men we can still have empathy compassion the transformational side of the business so what i would really want uh, you know if, if i had an ideal word and a world and i had a silver bullet in my hand i would change the entire appraisal system in an organization uh, for, for uh, to uh, to include all these aspects of gender because men and women do think differently and we, you know in teams we do uh, we do together we collaborate and cooperate and come up with the right uh, right decisions as you know game theory is also shown us as Harvard Business School uh, research has also shown us that teams that are uh, balanced as far as gender go make better decisions in the long run. So again, I mean, it's like <laughs> it's 
you know, tooting the same horn that mm. it is smart to invest in women at every level. Mm. Thank you, Roshana. And uh, the question, a final question, I think, from our audience before we start to wrap up, and th this is directed at Honey, but actually, I'd, I'd love to hear your views on it as well, Roshana, is, is that, you know, given that you're an active participant in the design sprint that led to the 2X and Ignite, wh why do you think such a facility is still required in this day and age? Um, I'm hearing so much about the business case being so clear, but what, so why, why, would, why would a special facility be required? Um, <clears throat> special facility is required, again, to, that, to address those aspects of a lot of fund managers, women don't have the track record. So how do you start building it? That's part of it. Um, that's the, there is this warehousing as well, which just shows that you can invest and in how you can do it. Mm -hmm. And then um, it's, it, again, the perception of risk is how to reduce that. It buys down the risk that mm -hmm. the investors uh, could have by investing in what is perceived a high risk, which I don't believe is high risk. Um, so it, it, it is very much needed today and it will have a huge impact. I'm sure of that. It is, you know, it's, it's like in anything else. When you remember the microfinance when it started, very few people would have invested in microfinance in those days. Uh, yeah. And now it's a big thing. Now it's a normal thing that even banks inv invest. I mean, lots of banks invest in microfinance. But there was a transition that we in the, in the in development finance world were very involved in and how do we bring in more money into microfinance so it's another thing that in, you know in five years time or 10 years time you will not hear about well, there's no need for this facility anymore and you will not hear about why do we need to have this you know women focused fund managers or women led fund managers or companies are a special breed um i just wanted before i you know we, we uh, Kai had asked an interesting question about uh, intersection of uh, uh, sustainability or let's say climate change and uh, inclusive investing, which I would just call it for right now, um, women-led um, uh, fund managers. So we have a very good example uh, in Egypt, it's Mizan, Mizan Capital. Um, and uh, I think uh, even the, the managing partner is on, on the call um, of intersection of focusing on women and at the same time focusing on climate change activity and investments. And so you can do that and it's not adding risks at all. It's just a matter of how do you find the good, uh, good companies that are led by women and how do you support them? Others will come. So when you see that women led companies in the climate uh, response area are getting funded, there are more women are going to come up to the plate and say, I'm ready to do it. I've been doing it. Here's my company. This is what I've been doing, et cetera. So the, these kinds of funds are very important to, to push that agenda forward. It's not the only solution, but there are many, many more. Um, Lovely. Thank, thank you, Hani. And um, I, we're now getting to the sort of the, the close, closing remarks. Is there, is there any final um, call to action that you would make? And I'm, I'm going to ask each of you this. Any, any call to action for emerging market investors that you would give to, to discuss a more inclusive approach to investing? Han, Hani, I'll start with you and then go to Roshana. So uh, for me, it is uh, things like the 2X Ignite and the 2X Collaborative um, are our calls of action and they are going to be significant enough. One is the, one is the financing facility, the other one is uh, an industry body that represents this. So it's, it's how, that's in one way. But on the, for me, on the basic side, it is when investors realize that they need to ask the question. And then when the investors get involved, because investors do have a huge impact on the whole finance, because they're the ones who set the tone. If they tell you, we shall not invest in this or that, everybody hears it and you're going to react to it because in emerging markets, it's the investors who have the say, not the fund managers, which is the opposite in North America, but let's not get into that. Uh, so it, it's working with investors is very important. It's not just the fund managers, working how, how investors approach fund managers and how they ask the questions. So as we introduced ESG some years ago and investors start imposing ESG on, on funds, same thing. It's about asking a question, having more diverse teams and more diverse companies to invest in becomes an important part of the response. Okay, thank you. I'm Roshana. Um, I would say more innovation from a gender lens, more products that can cater to women's needs. And second, I think we really need to uh, change the way we assess women-led businesses. It's not just about goals and KPIs. 
it's also about the social and transformational impact these businesses will have. So maybe my call to action would be, we need to change the way we assess businesses, especially the ones that either have women clientele at the front end or have women investors running it, uh, women uh, entrepreneurs running it. So I think that's really uh, something I would ideally, if it's possible, would put in, pitch in. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Hani, and thank you, Roshanna. I mean, my reflection from the conversation is that we really need to shift from this perception and, and turn it into something practical and, and that, that we're just doing. Um, it, I'm often reminded as someone who, who works in communications that we often only discuss this sort of thing on a, on a special event to discuss women, whereas I'd love to see the examples of female success just being second nature, that you, you don't think about it, it's just being talked about um, uh, in an integrated way across all elements of, of what we do. Um, so that, that would be my dream of where we would get to in future and, and making sure that, yeah, women, women are, are just an integrated part of, of the conversation going forward. But thank you both for your for your insights and your time today, and Roshanna, particularly for you for doing it from from your car journey. I really appreciate that, um, and and thank you to everybody on the audience for joining us too. Um, thank you for your questions and engagement. We've dropped some information about the Two X Ignite and the Two X Collaborative program um, into the chat, and there will be a recording um, of the uh, the entire event that we'll make available. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thanks again to Roshanna and Hani and um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you.